welcome and bienvenue, welcome to ETC, to ETC, to ETC. Okay, I'm a very bad singer, I know, but the reference I just tried to make is, of course, the song from Liza Minnelli from Cabaret. And it was a film who took place exactly in a moment like today, where theatre was very difficult to do. It was, of course, in Nazi Germany. It is not a, a fascism who we lived in the last year, but a terrible pandemic and theaters were silent again. So very welcome to our conference about silence theater and the effects of COVID-19. I'm absolutely delighted to be your host for the next hour and a half. We will have a wonderful performance, a panel discussion, and also the possibility for you all to participate with questions. You are very much invited to do this right now because we do this um, very specific ETC conference in partnership with whole round theater commons. And uh, thanks to this, we have a very large international audience today who takes place. And you all are invited to um, add your questions from now on and during the performance and the panel discussions to place your questions and we will try to answer them in the rest in the very end. And it would be delightful if you already say to whom your question is directed to. Um, the discussion we do right now is a part of the week of the new European drama ETC just does right now in a collaboration with the Schauspielhaus Graz. And this conference is also the very first hybrid format we're doing. So this means there are people like me all over the world, in my case from Berlin, who participate, but the panel members also are in Graz in the Schauspielhaus who is a wonderful host for this event, for the whole week, but also for this event. Um, it is uh, important in this time we are living right now to talk about silence in theaters, especially, of course, in Eastern Europe. I think about Hungary, Poland, or Slovenia. We will talk about this, and we have members from these countries today to talk about how theater is possible, how free speech and expression is possible or impossible in the times, in our actual times. Um, we will, in the very first time, of course, we in the first place, we will have some welcoming words and a little video from our host. Um, it is uh, because we are in the theater of Graz. It is uh, Iris Laufenberg we will meet right now. She will give us a little run through the Schauspielhaus and then at the end, she also will be live to say some welcoming words. So let's start with further ado from Graz, Austria, from all over the world with this first hybrid conference from ETC. First of all, the video from Iris Laufenberg and we will see us back in eight minutes. Hello everyone, I'm Iris Laufenberg. I'm the artistic director of this wonderful theater that you can see behind me. Uh, let me welcome you as a board, ETC board member and the host of uh, the ETC uh, Assembly and uh, General Assembly. I'm very happy, it's great to have you here. Welcome. Let me say a few words before I introduce you to a close and an old friend of our theatre. Graz is the second largest city of Austria and it's the capital of Styria and it's uh, situated very close to the Hungarian and Slovenian borders. Our pro program at the theatre is dominated uh, by contemporary playwrights, which fits very well in the fact that Graz has a huge tradition in current drama. We also focused in uh, intercultural projects. Now, another expert will take you behind the scenes Welcome, Mr. Steinsbein. Thank you very much, uh, Frau, Frau Laufenberg. Thank you very much. I'm, You're welcome. Uh, thank you. Thank, please don't interrupt me. Oh. Um, I'm one of the oldest uh, abonnenten. Uh, yes, I mentioned. Uh, wie heißt das auf Englisch? Sus subscriber. Sus subs 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 subscriber. I'm, I'm one of the oldest subscriber of this uh, theater. And I'm a very strenger Beobachter, a very strict uh, viewer of this theater. Okay. So, I'm very pleased and honored to take you on a tour through this theater. Digital technology means the possibility uh, to reach out beyond the city. So I will do my tour in English. No, when it is closed, if I only had known that. 
this tour wants uh, uh, to give you a quick overview so that you will find your way around easily. Naja, das ist schon ein Labyrinth, ehrlich gesagt. Ne? Uh, when you come to visit the theater the next time, yes. We will now start the stage at the stage entrance, visit several places inside the building and in about two hours we will leave it through the main entrance. So long! Before you enter the Schauspielhaus Graz, you have to check your temperature. So will I. Apparently, I'm dead. I, I, I'm looking for the Probebühne. Probe, we have to talk in English, you know. We have to talk? Okay. Yes. Okay. But yes. I need there, to go to the Probebühne. Yeah. There's a problem, there is no Probebühne. What? There is no Probebühne. Of course there is a no, Probebühne. There, there has always been a Probebühne. No, no, no. We have Haus 1, ja, Haus 2 and Haus 3. And when you drink, you can drink in Haus 4. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. House, also house, uh, yeah, yeah this, this is the new stuff, you know. Uh, yeah, yeah. Now they call it different. How is the Probebühne called now? You know what? House 2. 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 And how do I find House 2? What? How do I find House 2? Ah, so, yeah. That's tricky. <laughs> At the moment, the technical setup uh, for a production takes place that will have its world premiere in September at Deutsches Theater Berlin as part of another festival dedicated to contemporary authors. Solid. The play is, uh, by the way, is by Amanda Laska Berlin called Wonderful Me and How I Love Disturbing Content. This is a terrible title. Shoo, shoo. I want some privacy. Very charming. Yes, she is the reason why I have still my abonnement. So now we are. So, 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 sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm making my moderation now. We, I'm making my now. No, I'm making my moderation now. It won't be long and then I will be gone. So, now we are at house 3. House 3. The smallest, don't, uh, let me listen, don't read with me, I, I, I don't like that. So, we are on the smallest stage in house 3. House 3 is located on the third floor of the building, just opposite the entrance to the third gallery with the cheap seats. Uh, the Schauspielhaus Graz has approximately, no, uh, uh, exactly 550 seats, but now due Corona there are only 300 seats allowed. Yesterday there was a full house at the premiere of Ois Offen, which means, translated, it is a beautiful Styrian dialect, it means everything open or uh, uh, all are apes, I don't know uh, exactly. Uh, and this was a very emotional moment for me. A full house and theater again, seeing people on stage uh, after such a long period of time, half a year of closed theaters. And now we go down to the parquet and uh, stop for a short visit on the first floor to a very special place, the beautiful Redutensaal. This is very loud, the music. This looks very exhausting. Thank you for letting us uh, uh, see the rehearsals. Uh, I'm sure you are not very uh, pleased with that yet, but I think it will be great. Oh. Ah, I'm on the stage. I'm, I'm not supposed to be on the stage, but now, now you will see the stage. This is, uh, I suppose, uh, the stage design for The Great Dictator, a very uh, famous film. And now the Schauspielhaus Graz also uh, hops on the trend to bring films on the stage. Eight to ten new productions come out on this stage every year, plus some guest performances, mainly from well-known Austrian artists, writers and musicians. Altogether, the Schauspielhaus Graz 
brings out 20 new productions and performs around 440 shows during a season in Graz. Plus eventually some abroad, for instance, upon invitations of festivals or as guest performances. The ensemble consists of 20 actors at the moment and the theater finds it important to even out the number of male and female performers and directors. For me personally, it is of no matter what sex the artists have. Yes, it is no matter the quality is what is important for me as the oldest subscriber in uh, Schauspielhaus Graz. Yeah. Um, how, how, how do I get off here? Uh, he Help! This is very high, very dangerous. Now we are in the foyer, in, in this beautiful foyer of the Schauspielhaus Graz. We are at the end of this uh, tour. Thank you very much for your attention. And now I wish you, uh, uh, what's on A conference, gell? Conference. Yeah, I wish you a, a, a wonderful uh, Con conference, conference, con we, we, in, yeah, uh, and, and yeah, have a nice day and, and bye. Servus. <lacht>
and for all of us in the future. So thank you for your attention. Have a good time in Graz. And um, I would like to, uh, yeah, that you have a great and wonderful time. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. Also applauding from Berlin. Thank you so much, Iris. And uh, so after this little overview of what all happened in the Schauspiel of Graz, let me just also remind you that ETC is the largest European network from public theaters with 42 members from 25 countries. And one is the Schauspielhaus Graz, uh, who is hosting uh, this event this whole week and the event this morning. And uh, so Iris is also the ETC vice president. And I'm now delighted to introduce you to the ETC president, the very well-known Serge Rangoni. He is also general manager and artist director of the Theatre de Liège in Belgium. And he also has a little Welcome message for us. Dear colleagues, dear friends, first of all, I would like to warmly thank Iris Lofenberg for hosting our international conference in our theater. And of course, the ETC team for their persistence in organizing this program in spite of an unhelpful situation for international development in which we have been living for too long now. Thank you to Heidi, to Hélène, Teresa, Christy, and Juna. I welcome you all, dear network members and guests, to the Schauspielhaus Graz and its virtual theater on drama.digital, as well as the live stream audience. I'm very pleased that the ETC International Theater Conference takes place in the first ETC week of a new European drama, a week-long celebration of new writing and the relevance of theater stories for today's society. For this program, as a special link to the main theme of our conference, namely the international cooperation as a key to overcome the crisis, both globally and obviously for our sector. After more than one year of closed venues and theaters and following the political turmoil some of all fellow Europeans are facing, we must now more than ever resist the closing of the borders, the rising of nationalistic cultural policies, the future national budget cuts for cross-border activities, the absence of planning perspectives, and the production jam effect. Above all, we must find new ways for European collaboration to grow and last. We need to sustain European theatre as a fundamental public democratic space where open societal, societal dialogue can take place and diverse multilingual voices and intercultural perspectives can be heard. We need to sustain the European dim dimension of our work and ensure international relations beyond Europe. To make this happen, we have to set up and increased advocacy for the recovery of the sector. Begin of strategic transformation process in venues and awareness towards a more sustainable, diverse and digital practices and support the creation and sharing of joint narratives. The question we need to ask ourselves to lay the foundations for our reflection would be the following. How can we move forward each theater individually and together connected in our European theater network? I leave you with that thought for all now and pass the word to ID Wille, Executive Director of ETC. Hello and welcome also from me. 
it's a real pleasure to welcome you to this real ETC premiere. We've heard it's a hybrid event that we're organizing here. And this is just another premiere after the many new experiences that we made over the last year. When we first started to switch online, we created our digital stages, digital venues, simply to continue our work. And now I must admit, it really feels a bit surreal to be here in Graz, in the Schauspielhaus, in the Probebühne that we've just seen during the tour um, at the Schauspielhaus, with this nice stage decor behind me, and uh, seeing colleagues in front of me after 15 months of being distant. And um, therefore, we try to bring together our online community and the few lucky people who were able to travel to Graz to join this online program in our hybrid conference. So I hope you will enjoy this, but I think you all agree, being in the same space at the same time has been something very much debated as a condition for theater over those last months. And um, theater is for the here and now with audiences, we used to say. And it's so fantastic that this finally can happen again. At the same time, our digital stages, I'm sure they will remain open. But don't worry, I will not bore you now with all the details of Einstein's theory on the relativity of simultaneity. I'm sure you all know about this anyway. But I want to tell you, ahead of our conference, each of us will surely have different experiences and different versions of those conference days, given that you're all in your own space and in your own time, especially as we have audiences joining us from different time zones. And this means while some of us are still in the past, others are in the present, and some are already in the future. And while we don't know yet, and honestly, how keen we will be in the future to continue doing everything simultaneously, the good thing I want to remember about this is that there is always somewhere a future ahead of us, no matter what we lived through, especially in this last year, which was very devastating at times. A year in which many, nearly all of our theatre halls were silenced, closed, and no audiences allowed to enter. For us, in EDC, this was a very direct effect of COVID-19, as in terms of cooperation, we now face a prioritization and a focus towards national collaboration, then much later we think again about European collaboration, and eventually international collaboration. The reasons for this, Serge just mentioned. And our predictions are the further geographically distant we aim to reach, exchange and connect with one another, the more incentives will be needed, financially as well in regards to respecting the principles and values of ecological sustainability, and also thirdly, as we heard, to overcome restrictions of cultural diversity and freedom of expression as increasingly imposed by many liberal democratic governments in the countries we work in. So therefore, I hope these days here in Graz will inspire you and that these days will be constructive and to contradict Einstein that this time is no illusion, but these days will offer the time and the space for exchanges to create new works, new drama that reflects in the theatre programmes of public theatres in Europe the diverse notion of what Europe means based on diverse traditions, languages, opinions and dialogue, and that the talks that we will have and the collaboration projects that we develop during these days will help to reveal again the diverse voices on our stages and in our theatre halls, to ensure also the responsibility of the arts and humanities, to envision an open and equal Europe we want to live in for all people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. 
here i'm back again yes so thank you so much heidi Villy, so executive uh, director of etc and i agree so much with you nothing compares to be in the same room and living an artistic and creative experience together so uh, for this very lucky few people in graz it will be a live performance you will see for us it will be digital but we will think it will be live so i'm very happy to introduce our um, performance artist for today before we go to the panel discussion. Um, she is from Slovenia and is, uh, she is awarded with a lot of uh, uh, awards, the National Award for Best Play, Best Libretto, etc. Her writing, she likes to play with language and form and her um, the theme she's the most interested in is the dysfunctional modern society. This is a large field of action right now for sure, but also discrimination and feminism. So the, 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 the stage is yours, Simona Hammer from Graz for her performance named Everything is Possible or a playwright's notes on how reality became more dramatic than fiction. You will see us back in 15 minutes. Hello, good morning. Yes, my name is Simona Hammer. I am an award-winning playwright and dramaturg and I come from Slovenia a country that was hijacked by the, by the right-wing party leader in March 2020 and is still held hostage. Today, I want to show you what can happen when you mix a virus, fear, capitalism, nationalism, and playwriting. Everything is possible, or playwriters' notes on how reality became more dramatic than fiction. <laughs> Prologue. Autumn 2019, I'm writing a comedy about an epidemic of head lice uh, in an elementary school. I'm sure you can imagine. First there is one, then two, then parents start to panic and teachers get intimidated. At a nervous wreck of a principal, an ambitious substitute teacher and a paranoid security guard and soon we are rescuing children from gas chambers. But then real life intervened and all my great ideas about characters keeping two meter safety distance, wearing head protection and coming up with a system of segregation no longer seemed so brilliantly imaginative. 2020 changed the genre of my play from a comedy to a documentary drama and exposed that I suck. It turned out that every Facebook conspiracy theorist had more imagination than me, a professional writer. At first, I was pissed and depressed, but then I started to see the reality as a performance. I recognized the playwriting mechanisms, but boy, oh boy, the writers of this new normality are really badass. They established the anything goes rule, launched new genres and poetics, redefined conflict, boosted plot twist, chopped up the narration, upgraded the set, introduced new venues such as sofas and zooms, and wiped out catharsis. I was hooked and jealous. Act one, scene one. Now, every great tragedy opens with a chorus. But this new world order doesn't follow the traditional dramaturgy. Strike the chorus, you're not allowed to gather or protest. It's not good for public health, you know. So the streets are empty. People are hiding in their homes, obsessing over numbers of newly infected and killing each other over, over whose turn it is to use the computer. Months go by, a year goes by. Then a few teenagers gather in a public square with masks, safety distance and signs. Back to school, back to school. They should take responsibility for their illegal actions. This is their first step into adulthood. 
said the Minister of Education, who is, by the way, very proud of the fact that her country had the longest online schooling in the world. We are the champions, no time for losers, cause we are the champions. And then a bicycle drives by. Act one, scene two. Let's meet the characters. There's not much innovation here. Even the acting style is, well, a little old fashioned. Please give a warm welcome to ministers. I mean, a, a dramatis personae inspired by comedy dell'arte. Pantalone, a yes man that bans things. No protests, no investigations of corruption, no border crossings, no thinking, no, 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 no. Harlequina fights for water being sold back to you in a bottle. Then we have Il Dottore who passionately engages in culture of drinking. The prime antagonist is the so-called Slovenian patient, a convicted criminal and an unelected missionary that prefers tweeting over talking and insulting over, well, basically anything else. Then the protagonist, well, we are actually still searching for the, for the protagonist. A bicycle drives by. Act one, scene three. Costumes. I won't go into details about their complex influence on the narrative, characters, and choreography. I just want to point out one symbolic layer, uniformity. Now, uniforms seem to be a common threat since the government recently invested 780 million euros for military. To compare, this is four times the annual budget for culture. The public was strongly against a new combat action movie in the middle of the pandemics, but those in power ignored the constitution and forbade the referendum. We are the champions, no time for losers. And the bicycle. And another one. Act two, scenes one to five. An artist gets a letter. Ministry of Culture is informing him that because he spends too much time protesting instead of creating, they are taking away his status of self-employed cultural worker. It's illegal, so sue us. Oh, bicycles. People working in the film industry are waiting, waiting for the restrictions to lift so they can work again and waiting to get paid for the work they have already done. It's because of COVID, says the government and continues to block already approved funds allocated to National Film Center for eight months. Now, for all of you loving this story, I'm happy to inform you that it has a sequel, as well as a spin-off involving a national press agency and a crowdfunding campaign to support it until the government stops blocking taxpayers' money intended for this agency. Now, it's too soon to tell how it ends, but uh, spoiler alert, if you pay close attention to the visual narrative of the show, you will notice a certain flag hanging from the government buildings in support of actions that include bombing press agencies you don't like. T 
Theaters are closed for seven months, no live performances. And then, good news, you can reopen today, but under certain conditions. If the seating capacity is 400 people, 10 people can watch the performance and they have to prove they are vaccinated, tested negative or already had the virus uh, and wear masks. The government is, sorry, we live in exciting times, is the title of art and exhibition in Brussels accompanying our presidency of the EU. But then, very last minute, the show is cancelled by Il Dottore. He doesn't like one of the artists. Ten days and countless protest letters later, the exhibition is back on, co-curated by the minister himself. We live in exciting times. The government is working extra hard to appoint new directors, board members, members of committees. The speed of this process is so fast, actually two per day, it's not just the audience that can't keep up. Brand new 75-year-old director of National Book Agency said, I know a little about books, but I'm no expert for that types of agencies. We are going to do great as the guest of honor at the Frankfurt Book Fair in 2023. We are the champions! Act 3, scene 1. Name calling, pointing fingers, avoiding answering the questions, rambling on about irrelevant things, reinterpreting history, threatening. No, we are not watching a reality show, but a political debate on national television. Left wing government was in power for 10 years and they weren't able to provide additional accommodation in nursing homes, but our minister managed to secure 1000 new beds in only a year. Slovenia had one of the highest COVID-19 death rates. Most of the people who died lived in those nursing homes. So you do the math. We are the champions. Act three, scene two. Bicycles. This is how people protest. Peacefully and with a safety distance. Tens of thousands are cycling around the parliament once a week for more than a year now. I guess we do have a chorus after all. Can you hear them? We are the champions, my friend. And we... And then police sirens and helicopters and water cannons and... Cut. I forgot to tell you, this lecture performance is actually a work in progress. So the next step is to open up a public debate, to invite experts to share their professional analysis, ask questions, make suggestions. Because if you want to exercise your privileged position to speak publicly, you first have to excel at listening. Epilogue. As an artist, I'm struggling with great dilemmas. We all are. How can theater makers respond to this flood of destruction, hate, populism and bullshit? What to put on stage? How to be political and inclusive? How to satisfy the audience, the critics, the actors and the box office? How to step down from the hamster wheel of hyperproduction, but still offer a variety of quality shows and performative practices. To live stream or not to live stream. 
and then the safety measures and COVID and politics and what's the point of art anyway? Drama, drama, drama. <laughs> but in this chaos, we tend to forget about the basic and perhaps the most revolutionary power of art. To make us feel less alone. To give us a sense of community and to remind us that despite all the wonderful unique differences we are essentially the same we can all identify with pain fear anger love and with the characters that are for centuries now speaking their truths from the stage it is not my nature to join in hate but in love Thank you, thank you. Bravo, Simona Hama. Thank you so much, uh, this uh, Slovenian artist who gave us this fantastic journey about uh, a COVID year of creation or of non creation. And thank you so much for your humorful and self derision uh, um, way of telling this. It is now the moment for me to introduce you to our panel members who will discuss our main topic today, what was also the content, of course, of this performance, Silence Theatre in 2021, Illiberal democ Democracies and Effects of COVID-19. So first of all, I would like to introduce you to Nicolas Ninas. Uh, he is an... Um, member of the European Parliament, it's German, a uh, member of the Green EFA group since uh, July 2019. Uh, and he's also very much committed to culture and education. This is, he's a part of this. And uh, I would like, like all the other two members also, Martha Kale and Andras Demeter, I will introduce in a moment. I first would like you to have a reaction uh, from you, uh, Niklas, to Simona's performance knowing that you also were meant to be an actor in your younger years before you decided to become a political guy. Please, Nicholas, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, um, I was very, very happy for the little, for the little um, bicycle um, uh, <laughs> that came around all the time. And I, if I would have known that there was the catch of the, the presentation, I would have worn my bicycle shirt today as well. Um, now I think it's a, it's a great um, artistic summary. And so far, I'm, I'm also very happy to see the creativity that is still alive, thankfully, in theater business to, to, um, to not just develop an idea, but really transport a message and to really um, set that idea in motion. And I think that is so much more valuable than just talking about what's happening. And you know, that's also something that I'm having troubles uh, with in, in political communication to just like talk about the stories that happened in Slovenia, in Croatia, in uh, Hungary, in Poland, in several other member states where we have just such a huge impact on culture and on theater. Um, but people seem to forget um, what that means and where that leads to, you, you know. Um, attacking culture is always the very first step in order to change the society as a whole, in order to, um, to get rid of criticism, to get rid of freedom, and to get rid of free thinking in that society. And so I think it's very important to keep that in life and tell those stories so interesting that you really feel you're there, that you really understand what's happening and that you really get involved because of that. So thank you very much for that uh, very creative input here. Thank you, Nicholas, for this first reaction. Uh, the second reaction will be from Marta Kale. She's a curator and researcher from Poland, so one of the countries we unfortunately have to talk about because all these issues are also addressed for Poland. Uh, she is redefining modes of working transnationally because this is definitely one of our main themes today with all what's going on with COVID and with the rising populism, uh, especially in Eastern Europe, the transnational, the international, the European collaboration is more important than ever. So I would like uh, Marta to also give us a little uh, reaction to uh, Simona Hammer's uh, performance, please, Marta. Thank you so much, Annette. Um, I think uh, I would indeed um, 
follow almost all of the turn points, even the most, let's say, uh, hectic and the most uh, realistic ones that Simona presented, because in indeed I do recognize the patterns and I do recognize this kind of vicious sense of humor of the government also. I do recognize this pattern. I wonder whether they might have maybe graduated from the same school, so to speak, because indeed this kind of solutions and strategies seem to be similar. But maybe indeed, um, just to echo what Simona said and, and to echo what Niklas uh, mentioned, I very much agree that what is at stake here is actually not only uh, discussing the, the, the how the arts field would look like. So what is at stake here when the culture is being attacked or censored or uh, cut off from the public finances is not only the very way we're gonna work, it's not only the very way how the field is being structured and what is possible in the theaters or not, but it's also cutting off the very possibility or the very space to imagine the society otherwise, because this is what happens very often in the theaters, no matter whether they are public theater institutions or the small orga organizations that do, do the same work. And I wonder um, what we are losing then is the ability to conceive, to test, also sometimes to experiment the alternative ways of gathering, of getting together, of thinking together. And therefore uh, to create conditions for that is probably um, even more important nowadays than ever. And then in that sense, uh, indeed um, kind of creating conditions for imagining the society otherwise is something that can get us out from this very vicious entanglement of the neoliberal uh, economic system and the nationalist tendencies that we experience in Eastern Europe. But I'm afraid it's not only Eastern European problem. I do recognize a lot of fascist movements or, or right wing um, presence, unfortunately, in many other countries too. And this makes me feel re feeling really worried. And therefore, I think what is really crucial is indeed to try to find ways and common patterns to, to struggle against that tendencies. And therefore, indeed, as you said, Annette, probably one of the very few tools or solutions or strategies we might have is to work together, is, is to continue to find ways to have a contact with each other uh, outside of the national borders, because indeed during the pandemic, and I'll be happy to follow, that, follow it up later, uh, a contact with the peers from and, and different transnational activities was uh, not only um, what kept me standing in terms of the human relationship, but this is also at the moment the very, very only way that allows me to continue the curatorial artistic research practice in my own uh, local context. Otherwise, because of the current situation, it was just simply would not be possible. Thank you so much, Marta. I think we're all looking in the same direction when it comes to international and European collaboration. It's definitely a savior for us in this situation. Uh, Simona, just uh, in the beginning of her performance, she said, our country is taken hostage by the extreme wing uh, government also there. I mean, it's the same thing for peace in Poland or oh, also what's going on with Viktor Orban in Hungary. And this, of course, brings me to Andras Demeter. Um, I like very much the theater director uh, um, from Hungary, but he lives between Budapest and Berlin, works a lot with different and various German theaters also. Andres, uh, what was your feeling when you listened uh, to Simona's uh, performance? You also feel some echoes uh, from what she explains? Uh, it was very uncanny because just as Marta said, the patterns are the same. So um, I was, I, I tr just tried to imagine that and I had very often the same impression with my own works that something that's a reality for me can be an absurd horror story for, for, for example, for you, Annette, what's happening there. I really, I really uh, feel that this pandemic could have been a good, great chance for all societies all over Europe, you know, to, to stand together and to cooperate. But um, it was quite frightening and not only in East, East Europe, but uh, simply within the European Union, how extremely fast the, this, uh, it's, it's, uh, it turned clear that this, this common European thought that we have and, and the, these institutions that we believe in in the European U Union, how fast and how easily um, 
just disappears and the borders are back and the yeah i mean this this we all faced mentioning these patterns uh it was uh we had uh um here in budapest there's a famous roundabout uh on the on the side of the danube and there the cars were circling and monking so not the bicycles but that that was so it's almost the same it's not so green <laughs> it's not it's not a green solution but it but the same same thing happened here so the patterns are really really the same uh and uh you mentioned already the prime minister of hungary and for me it's 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 really such a you know it's so bad that even if if i i make a negative propaganda for him but it's still a propaganda so it's so it's so bad that we have to permanently talk about him and getting getting back to him uh, we will have elections next year in hungary 2022 and uh he's been on um, the prime minister since 2010 so like 12 years um there is a chance that an alliance of all the other parties which is a bit bit pervert so from the right wing uh, right extremists to the greens like all of them create an alliance against him which means uh, mathematically uh, that had been also clear during these years that if this alliance is there then uh, Orban does not have uh, the majority uh, so there is a chance uh, a good chance for for uh, getting back to a normal life in a year here in Budapest and um, what he did is that uh, he created a state of emergency as soon as the pandemic started and very much uses it's still there out there right now uh, and as the elections are coming next year he uses the state of emergency to empower uh, other parties to uh, to maneuver everything into, uh, for example, this uh, huge amount of monies to maneuver into foundations and like, uh, I don't know, changing the constitution again and again and again. So here, especially here in Hungary, I would say that the pandemic with the state of emergency uh, was... Uh, I would rather say that this, the, 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 mo the, the most frightening thing was this state of emergency and not not the uh, not the um, not the horror of the of the pandemic itself i get it very, very well andres by the way when you said he's 12 years in power and you need a coalition of all parties to get maybe rid of them i'm sorry i'm thinking yeah. about israel it's exactly what happened right now netanyahu was 12 years in power and the actual coalition would try to 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 yeah. push him away from this prime minister post is also from the far left to the far right so it is the same idea everybody yeah. has to come together to overcome uh, uh people who concentrate too much power in their hands and giving maybe not the right direction but we won't talk about israel i just yeah i just just sorry yeah. to interrupt you anita I, one thing that that's also happened uh in the last year is that uh the trump is gone and i think it's it's quite important and I think it also has an effect on what's going to happen, for example, here. It was uh, uh, this prime minister whose name I don't want to okay. say. It's like the, the, like the, you know, it's like in Harry Potter. I don't know what's the name Absolutely. of this don't have little, to say evil the character. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> By the way, all American yeah. commentators, the yeah. funny ones of the late shows, they uh, do everything to avoid the name Trump. Yeah, too. They say everything you want, but not the name. Yes, don't be, give be them. For, be, before, before the elections uh, in the United States, uh, he speak up very clear, clearly for Trump. Uh, and it was quite hard. It was almost absurd that in the, in the media, after Biden won the elections for three, four days, they could not clearly communicate that in Hungary, what happened, because the, the prime minister was so much on the side of Trump. And, uh, and I think this, this, this really, uh, the change in the United States, of course, will definitely have an effect on, on Europe and especially on uh, East Europe. Yeah, Absolutely. that's what I wanted to say. Absolutely. So I will ask you for some more concrete examples of how these uh, last year, especially affected concretely the cultural scene in Poland and Hungary. But first I want to 
to give the word back to our youngest panel member, Nicholas. You're also one of the youngest European Parliament members. So you are involved in European politics now. What we can do on the political level to support free speech, creation, collaboration across borders, and not to think with this border in the head and to, to self-restrain yourself on being creative in countries like uh, Slovenia, Hungary. But I mean, also, let's say, it, you're totally right, by the way, just to say this also, it is not only Eastern Europe. I mean, in France, uh, um, cultural was definitely not a priority. The, the land of all this cultural priority normally, it was not at all in all this time. They opened everything else before they opened theaters. So there's a real problem. What politics, what you can do in the European Parliament or on national level to help these creation going back and to be free and over the borders, Nicholas, please. Thank you, a very good question. I also want to reiterate that, that we have the problem with um, with really canceling culture, uh, not just in, in, in Eastern European states, but everywhere where um, uh, yeah, wannabe dictators feel threatened by too much criticism and too much liberal um, um, uh, or freedom of the arts and therefore do everything they can and use obviously every method they can find, especially like a, a pandemic. I do think that it's like for all of us, it has been um, uh, a, a, um, a curse, but for them it has been a, a positive uh, rain and a blessing because then they could really uh, pick out their, their most favorite uh, haunting tools in order to to um, to crush down on, on critics and especially on the culture. So this is really true in a, a lot of member states. I'm very happy that, for example, in Italy, we don't have Lega at the, uh, or had Lega at the, at the, at the um, ministry at that moment, because they would probably um, been also very, very much bad. Um, now, uh, one, one, just one word concerning Trump and, and, and the, the future of votes and elections. Um, I mean, one thing, one positive note that we saw was in Poland, that there also um, we saw for the first time, you know, a little dent um, with the election or again election of the current president, but like with only 50, 51%, so really, really close election. So I think we, we do have a chance to, to change that. And now for your question concerning what we can do. So first of all, we obviously have, for example, from the European Re Union, just uh, two weeks or three weeks ago, we reaffirmed Creative Europe, which is a big and now even bigger program, the biggest we've ever had. But to be quite honest, it is still too small and it is still too difficult, in my opinion, because um, I know of a lot of um, artists, especially from Poland, for example, they always want to apply for that because they know that they don't get funding from other national sources. So therefore they go for funding for Creative Europe. But they always need colleagues, which is hard if you are not, you know, if you're condensed in, in Poland and if Poland doesn't want you to step out. Um, so they have the, those troubles and it's always a lot of paperwork. So we need to make that easier also. And I think we need to ensure that we have a certain non-cross-border dimension as well because Creative Europe always has this cross-border dimension which is great which I believe is very important because we want to bring uh, you know European ideas together and, and, and experience the European culture but I think in order to ensure creativity and freedom of the arts we also need to support those people in their own member states who are critic, critical of, um, of the government, who are opposition and who don't get funding because member states funding is bound to certain criteria. And in order to help them, I think we need also a, a cross-border dimension free uh, no, long <laughs> term um, uh, instrument to support them. And then, and you know, this is, you know, very critical in European politics because we don't have competences in this field, blah, blah, blah. It's written down in the, in the, uh, in the treaty of the European Union, but we can change that treaty, right? I mean, that is always the thing of politics. We don't want to step where we are. And so at the moment we have the conference on the future of Europe and I'm really, really um, hopeful for this process to be honest, because in his opening speech, the representative from the European parliament, Mr. Guy Verhofstadt, and he's a liberal, not even a green, but he said that we should rethink whether we want to open the question of uh, more competences in culture for the European Union. Uh, Monet, when he founded the European Union afterwards, he said, if I could do it again, I would start with education and culture because that brings people together. And I also, we have, we have organized the Culture Creators Friendship Group, which is, which is a group of member, members of the European Parliament from all um, parties, um, except from the very far right, from the idea, but from all six others. Um, and we have um, a lot of our members 
are actually also part of the Conference on the Future of Europe, and we want to discuss whether we can ensure more on that, and we're actually, actually the discussions are going on there. So if you want to support that, I think it's great. And for competence-wise, of course, we don't want to you know, take away national identity and regional identity, but to ensure that the European Union itself is the, is the guarantee that there's freedom of arts all over Europe, and that means economic freedom, but also um, judicial freedom. I think that is the minimum standard that we need to set. Absolutely. Um, I would uh, directly would like to give the world to Marta. Just before I would write, uh, like to re uh, remind everybody who's listening to us right now, you can ask questions to our panel members, or also uh, to Simona, if you would like to please write your questions in the chat, let us know. We will open the question in less than 10 minutes. So just write your questions and we're happy to answer for this. So Marta, uh, uh, Nicholas just said, he is in favor of very specific European programs who help artists inside of the countries, even without this crossing border and uh, pluri uh, uh, dimensional financial uh, support like Europe normally always condition. And this is a very good idea, as said Nicholas. Um, very concretely, Marta, for creating in Poland today something who is not only patriotic and nationalist and in the peace way of looking to culture, what are the obstacles and what would help you to be more creative and more free in your speech for creative, creative, creativity? Thank you so much, Annette, for this question. It's, it's, a, it's a brilliant one and exactly uh, what Niklas just said uh, that very much rings the bell. And this is maybe I, I don't feel kind of um, uh, um, in position to represent the whole field. So maybe I can just kind of root the, the, the reflection in my own experience. So I can give you a kind of example of how it, how it works at the moment. My situation is exactly as the one that Niklas just described. So I can basically um, survive as a performing art curator and continue my work, my practice, only thanks to the European funds. No matter whether they come, they come from particular national states because I do a project there or they come from the European Union Creative Europe projects. Um, and indeed, but in order to do so, I am, and I'm saying that I am moving slowly out of the country and I will surely uh, also because um, uh, my partner, who's also a curator, we both lost a festival that we've been running for five years in Lublin, a theater festival we lost it for many reasons one was that we did not want it uh, to turn we did not want to follow the direct demands of the local government which is not right-wing and that was really dangerous it was rather the local government who wanted to use the festival as a tool to promote themselves and this is what we did not accept and therefore we could not continue the, the festival my partner just uh, got a job that will uh, make him continue uh, his career as a curator, but it's outside of Holland. And it's happened after, uh, I guess, uh, 10 competitions he took part in and 10 attempts to establish something here in the country. And it's not that we want to live. We never thought about it. And it's not an easy decision. And what would help us out is definitely a kind of stability or any kind of structural fund that could allow our peers, colleagues, and everybody being in the field to continue their work here locally. Because what I'm seeing at the moment is that I can't have any kind of um, political influence. I can't help the artists I usually work with. I can't support them anymore. And in order to kind of root and, and, and nutrish the local field, I have to go out of the country. And therefore, to the certain extent, that would, not, that would not be sustainable, also because um, not being locally embedded, not being locally grounded will uh, also diminish the impact of actually influencing the field and actually making develop. And this is what I miss a lot. And this is absolutely what this kind of fund that is not necessarily only cross-border would help a lot. Another thing uh, I guess that is really problematic at the moment, and this is again an a very kind of embodied experience. This is exactly what we are at at the moment. We run, a, after we lost the festival, we invited uh, four artists we mm, used to work with a lot, based also in Poland. And we formed a, a collective performing arts institute as a small collective of six people. And at the moment, we are part of two big European networks and two big European Creative Europe projects. The problem is there is no way to get a matching fund, no matter whether on national or on a local level. And we are at risk of losing the projects. And therefore, 
And it's not only our experience, it's an experience of many organizations right now in Poland, but also in, in, in Hungary, for instance, the, colleague, the colleagues say exactly the same thing. I presume that might, have, that might happen in other countries in the so-called region quite soon. So what would help a lot is this kind of, I guess, um, thinking about how the solidarity among the Euro European countries can be practiced and how in the countries that don't support any kind of critical thinking and therefore everybody um, busy with these topics and trying to propose an alternative to the nationalist tendencies absolutely. is is actually cut off of the founding how can they be supported also when it comes to the european projects how can the matching fund be somehow helped that would be also a very helpful solution let me make another reference to cabaret money makes the world go around i mean it is for sure funding is key here and i'm sorry to say this directly to you nicholas european funding also because we can't count on anybody right now in Poland to finance, for example, projects you're talking about. Yeah, funding is key. So theater to be good and to be free and to express itself needs money. Let's be totally face it, without money, no creativity. We can do little things for free and whether, but you can't uh, uh, go along with real big projects. So yeah, I think we heard you, Martha. And uh, everybody who has ideas for funding, don't hesitate to give them around. Andres. I have now a very first question, especially for you. I will read it, it's coming in the chat. Um, the question is, you mentioned that it's frustrating that the conversation always returns to Prime Minister of Hungary, Hungary, even if your attention is negative propaganda. So do you think that now is a bad time to tell stories on stage about fascist or authoritarian leaders because this is still propaganda for those people and ideas? So it's a kind of dramaturgical uh, question for you. You got it? Yes, I got it. Yes, please. Yes. Very good question. It there's there's it's it's very logical the question. So uh, I think the I my I I had been always dealing with uh, as an artist as a theater director with political questions, but I'm. I, I'm personally more interested in the in the perso personal stories that are beside the political um, what that are beside those tendencies that happen in the politics. And I'm also not an expert. I, I very honestly, I don't want to be an expert of politics. I'm not interested in politics. I just think that politics should be, you know, something like um, this. I think politicians should work uh, unseen, invisible for us. Sorry, sorry, Nicholas, for saying that, but making a system working for not for artists, but each and every people in each and every country. And I'm so much fed up with the with with populism. And also, it was in the in this text of Simona, Facebook, uh, and so on. How how Facebook and Instagram and all these platforms are used by politicians, how, how the political life or politics has become something that's consumed, that's superficial, it's, it's, it's like pop songs, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's something I can't stand. And I just simply uh, don't want to be part of it. I don't want to connect to these, to these uh, simplified and statements about the, uh, the political lives uh, or the political political life and uh, what I'm interested in as an as an artist is to to see or to focus on what's happening to us uh, who are suffering because because of the systems absolutely that they create yeah but the society you want to reflect is also more and more politically especially in your country so you can totally avoid the political themes I just uh, thought about it's, it's a bit like I would say like wait, wait, uh, when you're in a horror movie and you see the survivors right and you're with them how they survive and you're not you don't want to analyze the monster too long <laughs> to very but the, the, there's another question in the chat about the risk taking so, sorry sorry I, go, I, go I, ahead, think, I think understanding for example the prime minister I think it's a psychological question you know that's my real problem that we are really talking about ideologies 
like if there would be anything. I think it's about power and money and extremely huge economical interests and corruption. And all these that we are talking about, it's, I think it's just the package. It's just what covers the, I mean, Orban made a clear change. He, he was, this is quite well known, that he started as a liberal, uh, cool politician. And, revolution. And, and then he realized that with this, he won't be the prime minister too long, or he can't be the prime minister. So he slowly moved uh, to the center and then from the center open up to the far far right wing really trying to 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 collect everyone together and just focus on winning the elections and Absolutely. sitting on the top of the pyramid and therefore it's for me i feel that i'm in in his stupid trap when i really um try to you know think that these these ideologies are serious i think it's it's against you know, it's, your, 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 your freedom of thinking. I understand very well. I, I, I lose, I lose, my, I, I lose my, 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 my freedom, this, this freedom when I try to, you know, just, just to be in the frame of this. I understand very well. I, I just, uh, uh, this reminded me also the question of what we put on stages in these times. Graf's theater just prepared a dictator from Charlie Chaplin. We heard this in the introduction from uh, the very funny introduction from this old subscriber before. I'm very happy that uh, Simona also is joining us again on stage. Hello, Simona. Okay, so you're from Slovenia, facing, let's be easy, same problem as Poland and Hungary right now. Um, with all these um, um, influences and all these mind settings, just Andras also talked about, how do you feel? Do you think you are ready to for some risk taking for your next pieces you will write? Or do you feel already like that you had to put water into uh, your theatrical wine to survive in these uh, uh, these times in Slovenia, for example. Uh, being a freelance artist, this isn't actually, it's a good question, but it's not the question that I'm able to answer because I have the feeling that artists all over the world are risk takers or feel um, the necessity to address political or personal issues uh, as well, or current affairs. I think it's more the question whether these uh, plays or performances are put on stage, are being staged. So I guess it's up to uh, artist, artistic directors of the, the theatres if they are able to recognize um, how very important important it is to address certain subjects although they are maybe frightened they are too political it's interesting then in that in slovenia you have a lot of freelance artists or ngos actively protesting or actively opposing some of the the laws or or the government but it's usually the people uh, in institutions with certain amount of job stability are kind of, you know, holding back, which is again, understandable, but then it's left to, to, to the most uh, vulnerable uh, uh, people in our society to, to uh, expose themselves. I get it very well. Thank you for this. I, I think even as a freelancer, the question is not only because you're not theater director, you don't have this problem of self-restriction in your mind, given the circumstances of the society you live right now. I will read you another question coming from uh, our audience. It's for all three of you, or four of you, I'm sorry. Which such a difficult context, facing theaters, what can we do to keep the spirit of risk-taking in theaters alive over the coming years? This is for all of you. Nicholas, you will, even as a political representative, you can answer to this question. Yeah, I'll try to because um, it's it's a little bit, I think, the, the points that are already made to, to ensure that we have funding available, even if you are not in line with the state uh, state's main line, like um, like only to, to be favorable of the government and all, only to, to praise God and the state and uh, the nation and whatever, but also to be able to, to have projects that do something different. Um, so I think that's why it's important to have like an independent source of funding uh, available. Um, 
or as independent as possible. And then on the other hand, I also think that um, what, what's especially important during these times, and maybe not so much for the theaters, but more for the people working there, especially for example, free um, freelancers, um, is to ensure social security uh, all over Europe, that we have a social security net that ensures uh, job loss, that ensures uh, like in these times where you just don't have the possibility to, to get a job, um, uh, healthcare, of course. And what I also find very important is, is, is pension funds to ensure that those who are doing work right now will also have the possibility to when they, they don't have the power anymore to be on stage. I know everybody wants to do it for their whole life, and uh, but probably it's not possible and that that's true for all artists whether you you're you're a musician or whatever um so uh, to to have a good good life at the end as well and i think if you have this security in the bank that's very important um, and that helps a lot to do to to be more creative and be more um outgoing and i also think you know this is this is also why i say like european union as a guarantee for freedom of the arts in all forms uh, which also means the social security all over Europe, because we do have that in members in some member states, for example, in Germany, it's possible, but also there. Um, uh, um, um, people um, who are freelancing and working together with theaters, they, they uh, I think they have a lot of times very big problems to come into the Kunstsozialkasse, which is a huge problem. And they also don't get, uh, get a, um, a system of uh, freedom for job loss. So, uh, and this Absolutely. is in a, in a member state where we have a very good system. In other member states, we have it far worse. And I know from Hungary, for, uh, for example, uh, musicians there who said, well, during Corona, I don't have any uh, income. And, Thankfully, I was booked at this and that university to give lessons, even though they're not there anymore. But if Orban doesn't like you, uh, you're not booked uh, in the university and you're suddenly gone. And that is true. And I mean, the attack on the SS SCFE um, exactly during that time is no coincidence. Definitely not. Absolutely. Because this was the last straw to break the, the neck of all the, of all the artists. We are totally agree. Uh, we have a maybe soon last question from our panelist. I just will read it to you. Self-censorship is a great problem in Eastern Europe. What do you think about it in your own context? Education is really a key issue. What do you think about the possibility of innovative artists and educators uniting forces and working on social issues? Martha, Andres, Simona, what do you think about this? Um, I would definitely say that the self-censorship, to start from the first question, is an issue at the moment. Um, and what I recognize, there are two levels. One is, let's say, more direct. The other is um, economic one. So, I mean, the self-censorship that happens uh, because you are afraid of having some troubles as a person who runs an institution, for instance. You're afraid of inviting some artists or raising some topics. Um, because you might uh, have to meet some problems or you simply kind of, and this is what I observe a lot, um, a lot of even very progressive, so to speak, whatever that means, uh, institutions um, kind of shift their program to a more safe zone. And this I find even more problematic because it's, it happens in this kind of almost invisible way. And then the results are really severe because you lose another space when again risk or simply asking questions. Sometimes it's not even about taking risk, but it's simply about asking questions. What I realize is that um, if anybody dares to raise questions instead of um, coming with a ready uh, answer, this is already treated as a very problematic because it creates a kind of feeling of insecurity. So um, we just had a situation in one of the big institutions in Krakow where the part of the exhibition was censored by the institution and by the curator actually, um, because it uh, represented some of the posters from the women's strike that happened during the pandemic here in Poland. And not only it started much earlier, but during the pandemic we did uh, spend too much too of our time on the, exactly on the streets. And just the presence of the posters from that, pro from that protest was the reason was the reason to actually cut off part of the exhibition and it happened not by the intervention by the any kind of local or national government it uh, was um, it happened because of the decision coming from the institution and the curator I and this is probably the most that. problematic exactly or by simply this and this is this part of economic censorship like you just simply don't better cut it by yourself 
before you meet with the consequence of losing your funding. And this is very problematic. This is definitely against all free creativity. There is a vicious system, I would say. So we be talking about your three countries right now, Poland, Hungary, and Slovenia, but we agree it is not only in this. There are other countries facing difficulties. I don't want to put the blame only on these countries, of course. It's a vicious, a vicious circle of self-censorship founding uh, um, organizations where key member posts are uh, uh, occupied with people on the line of the governments, etc. So maybe one last idea from my side could be just with not only with the programming, but more transparency and communication about this. Maybe ETC can definitely be one of the uh, echo uh, rooms for this, that when something like this happened, that all Europe knows knows about it, that it's not only the local point or just in Poland, but that, that we have a kind of megaphone. So everybody in Europe is aware about what's happened. And again, not only in your three countries. I think this is definitely something politics play a role, but ETC can also play a role here to communicate more about all these different levels of censorship. I hope you agree with me. Yes, I think we agree with you. I, I was also 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 thinking of the of uh, of the spectators because because I think if you consume art and you're interested in new tendencies, let's say in theater, of course you need to watch many many bad things, uh, and then you suddenly get something good. But you need this, you know, you need this, you need to uh, be open and stay open. Uh, this we this we we always face we go to festivals and we we see many diverse things and there's always something in it but they're many many times not really really good and, and this is i think it's natural and this is because of of the um, that that we are risking or the festivals are risking and the artists are risking and this is the price and i think in those societies and let's talk uh, about our societies where people are tired of polit politics they're frustrated uh, they don't have that much money they don't take the risk to go to many uh, performances to watch you know and this is this might be you know not so philosophical but what i say but suddenly then 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 it's a very practical thing they say okay i don't want to see uh, i don't want to see something that's risky to watch so i just I just go for that performance that where I know the name of the artist, where I know the ensemble and uh, where I get for my money that I don't have too much of what I what I, what I want to get. And I think this is this is also something that's a problem uh, in, in these societies. Where we are from. courageous spectators. You're totally so, right. Not so, so yeah. yeah. Could I add and one, for one and for courageous there? for courageous spectators, I think we need strong societies. Absolutely. Where, yeah. Totally. We make a last round, Niklas, Marta, Andres, and Simona, and then we have to conclude. Please, Niklas. All right. I just wanted to add one thing here. I think um, the it's not just to have courageous spectators, but also to have um, or I mean the, the conclusion is right to have a society where that is normal. But I think we need to in, invest more or do more general uh, education for for the arts and with that i don't only mean to like understand what the big arts is doing but also give the possibility to experience art yourself and to become an artist and not just you know in a highly professional way but just like you know painting a picture like doing a, a short uh, course in theater and um, playing an instrument on a semi uh, amateur level right so these little things just to get involved into art and to understand how great it is and and then because of that involvement to really go out and want to see more and go go to the the the, the stages to the theaters and then also be critical and be like this is bullshit right this this I do presentation was just plain bad but i know it was bad because i experienced it myself i tried out myself and so on and then uh, enjoy it more and i think we need to i like this very much 
And we are, by the way, we're, we're doing a, a resolution at the moment, preparing it in a, a report in which we are talking about the situation of artists. And that was very important for me to include there as well, and also to ensure that we have more time in our lives to actually spend on art in general and in culture to actually enjoy mm. that. I think that's also I very think important. We all agree about this. Unfortunately, we are only at two minutes more. So, Martha, your last conclusion word about uh, self censorship or oh, courageous and uh, education for arts, please. I'm thinking actually about a fourth point, which would be how to make the, the voices uh, being heard. And I'm thinking about the role of indeed the networks, um, just to come back to what has been said uh, a minute ago or two, what is possibly the role of the networks as ETC? And I do strongly believe, and this is probably one of the experiences we might all have shared uh, last year, that indeed the single voices are not that necessarily um, uh, audible Impact. and not, and actually don't have such an impact as the multiplicity of voices. And therefore I do believe in a strong role of, of networks and, and, um, and collective initiatives that could indeed present and also the, the problem, but also probably advocate and be reach out to the ones that the single singular freelancer not necessarily has a has a access to. Exactly what we would conclude in a minute after Andras give his last word, please. So I have 20 seconds, right? I think then let's let's uh, stay courageous and brave. And that's that's what I would uh, suggest for all of us and not to be so nice and so civilized how we talk here, because this is this is on a long term, it's not changing the thing. So I think we should just be radical and clear and keep together. Okay. Absolutely. I 100% subscribe to your last word. Simona, your last word for today? Yes, if we leave politics aside, I think the question is how we as an artistic or theatrical community can support each other on a national level and, of course, across the borders internationally. Absolutely. Thank you so much to all of you that you joined us today and, and shared with us your point of views. It was very enlightening for me to listen to you. And the very last word will be to Heidi again, our executive producer, because ETC just did something especially in the spirit we talked about. You supported a wonderful project called Renaissance with a lot of theaters all, uh, all over Europe involved to make short drama films. And I think you have a favorite one, Heidi. Please talk us about it. All these films are on the website of ETC. Please, Heidi, give us your favorite. Absolutely. Thank you so very much, um, dear speakers and Annette, for this uh, very important discussion. And yes, our Renaissance season that we launched last month, together with uh, 22 theatres from 18 countries, bringing together 250 artists, all came as a result of our four-year project, Engage, empowering today's audiences through challenging theatre. And so this is what we continue doing also in the pandemic. And the Renaissance is the result of this, our prompt to the Renaissance theme, how theatres can relive. And my favourite, it changes every day. We have 22 very, <laughs> very special productions, drama films that all have been produced for this specific project. And they're so different. But my favourite today is the one from Göteborg in Sweden. And I think it couldn't be a better conclusion to this discussion this morning. And um, yes, I Let's think- Let's take a look. Wonderful. Let's take, take a look. look. I think we can actually play it now to show yes. you. Let's do this and then we say goodbye to each other, please. Make theater great again. 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 Make Theater great again, 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 make 
We have to break again, break. 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 We have to break again. Break! We have to break! So, break! We have to break again! 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 Mike, Peter, Mike, 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 Oh, I loved it. Thank you so much. I'm missing so much theater and this kind of experience. This was a wonderful conclusion word uh, to say, yes, we need a Marathorian spirit to make theater great again. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And Andres, uh, um, everybody who just, uh, um, yeah, here we are, Martha and Nicholas and Simona, and of course, Heidi. Uh, to uh, to uh, have been along today for this wonderful uh, first hybrid conference from ETC and the program of the um, drama week of course goes on but for our part we will say goodbye and thank you very much for your participation and Heidi will in some minutes give you the following program thank you so much and make theater great again bye-bye Thank you so much, Annette. Goodbye to the uh, live stream audience as well. And I would like to invite all our ETC member theater colleagues and invited guests to stay on in our conference. And uh, after a short comfort break, uh, we will meet at um, 11.45 to our next session, where we'll have the pleasure to see young 